Welcome for yet another Mosaic Arts Online live event on our YouTube channel. And what an honor it is to bring in one of my favorite Mosaic Art teachers, as well as a good friend, Kelly Knickerbocker, all the way from Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Today's a really special day. Not only are we launching one of Kelly's four courses that she came to shoot here a couple months ago very safely, but we are so excited to talk about a really important <clears throat> subject that Kelly has done an amazing job. I don't know if mastering is really the right word I want to use, but just someone that has really brought to life a very important part of mosaic art that I think is so important. And having had Kelly here many times at the Santa Barbara School of Mosaic Art, it is an honor now that she has brought this course to Mosaic Arts Online so it can reach so many more people because I think it's really something that can be a game changer in your mosaic art and it is creating space in your art. And I'm actually going to flash you right now her <laughs> <laughs> that she did make here. And one of the benefits of being the owner of Mosaic Arts Online is the art stays here. So <laughs> I have a huge collection of some amazing art from some incredible instructors that have come through here. And this is just, Kelly has left us a few and this is one of them and I'm so excited. The other thing Kelly is going to do, which is pretty awesome, is not only is Kelly gonna show us her studio, but she has bought a special little gadget called a gimbal for us camera nerds that will make it so cool for her to take us around her studio and show us some really uh, beautiful work that does represent space in her art plus other stuff. Plus you'll get to see how Kelly stores her work um, and stuff that's been around for a while when Kelly is like the material queen to me. She's been using crazy materials as you've seen in her other um, live event when we talked about materials. Kelly uses some really interesting and amazing uh, materials to create her mosaic art. And so you'll see a lot of that in her studio, as well as Kelly works on easels, which is very, um, I think, uncommon in the States uh, for many mosaic artists. So I think it's a great introduction to see what that looks like. So um, please, in our chat, say hello and where you are from. <laughs> And most importantly, if you are not new, then you know, stay till the very end for a very special bonus. But if this is your first time at one of our live events, please stay till the end. We do have a very special, generous gift for you. So without th further ado, a friend I met many, many years ago at my very first Society of American Mosaic Art Conferences, my friend Kelly Knickerbocker. All righty. Um, so do you just want me to start talking about space? I want you to just say hi, how's it going? And then I've got some questions for you. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you for tuning in. And I was just telling Tammy that my studio has not looked this good since before the epidemic. So thank you for um, giving me a reason to clean this crap hole up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're gonna see it, you're gonna see all the stuff. And uh, you know, mostly it's good. Uh, the, some corners I'm not gonna show you, but um, <laughs> so anyway, it's so good to be here again with Mosaic Arts Online. I love Tammy and I love this, um, this venue and this opportunity to get with you guys and to you know share some of the stuff I do and just say hello, especially during epidemic times. Um, it's just so lovely to connect in whatever yeah. way we can. So I'm so glad to be here and have you all here and make comments, talk in the chat yeah. and ask any questions. Uh, we'll hit them. We'll, we'll do it. Yes, so for sure. Thank and, you. and I think that's really important what you said, Kelly. This is our connection uh, stream right now. This is how we are connected. We know we can't really physically be together times are still challenging, hopefully not too much longer. But until then, this is really important to me that Mosaic Arts Online is not just a venue for selling courses, but it's a place for connection. And yeah. there will be more of that coming in other ways too from Mosaic Arts Online, but this is really special that Kelly has joined us <laughs> to share her part of uh, creating Mosaic Art. So we did have a couple questions come in when right. we sent the email out. So I think I'm just going to jump into one question right now, Kelly, so that it kind of just dives right into the whole space thing and why that's uh, worked for you in, okay. in creating it. So the question is, when you plan for the spaces in the mosaic before or as when you uh, plan for your spaces in your mosaics, is it before or as it emerges? Is yes. Drawing pre construction 50% or 90% complete? How is it conceptualized? Oh, yeah, because that's an easy question. Um, 
so uh sort of yes it's it's all of those things it's it um I usually have an idea in the composition um, I'm, that I'm trying to do. Uh, I, I have to think of space beforehand somewhat. Um, for example, if I'm going to be using it as a framing device, because there's like seven or eight ways you can use space in Mosaic. So some of them I need to think about beforehand. Is it going to be space around the edge as a framing device? I need to know that beforehand. Um, are, are things going to peter out at the edges or at the top or at the bottom? I kind of need to know that beforehand, so I'll plan for that. But then sometimes as I'm building, I decide, oh, I want to add space in yet another way. And so that can happen very spontaneously. I want to leave an opening here or I want to capture space within a tessera here. So it, it's both sort of. It, it happens both ways. Um, so sometimes the, the mosaic is all about the space. And so that's a conceptual thing that happens at the front end. Um, but, but then other times it's just like, oh, space would be good here. <laughs> There's been a whole lot of density and we just need some breathing space. So I'm going to add some here. So both ways. And maybe it's a good time right now to ask you, really, I know the answer to this question, but how <laughs> did space become something that you worked into your work that has been so successful? Yeah, well, it's a very practical beginning. As with so many things uh, with me, it starts out for a practical reason, uh, in a practical way. Um, so uh, in 2014, uh, Giulio Minosi asked me to contribute six artworks to uh, an exhibition that he was putting together um, with different artists. And they were going to be three different venues, two artworks per venue. And um, he needed them between the time we were talking and the time that they had to land in Italy um, was for me 21 work days. And so six pieces in 21 work days. Um, I thought, okay, I was also thinking, I don't want them to be insubstantial. I want them to be significant, not little tiny things. And so I thought the only way that's possible is if they are at least half space. <laughs> so half mosaic and half space. And so that's how I built them. And each one was, um, it was a series, um, and uh, it's somewhere on Facebook, you can look back and see it's, it's with paper and gold smalty and hard materials. Um, and it's all in uh, elemental sort of black and white um, tones. And so they were each 29 by 18. And um, so there were six of them that were that size. And the only way they could be that size and get done in 21 working days was um, to have them be half space. And so sort of a crash course in, <laughs> How can I design something that is in a mosaic way, strong and significant, and yet does not take up <laughs> much of the substrate? Um, so that was, that was how it started. And that, that sort of cemented, so to speak, with me that this was possible, that it opens up, um, it, it opens up horizons that I didn't even know I could cross over or you know, things possible size and speed that I didn't even realize I could do. So well, that's where it became really important to me. And, and how many times do we lean on the quote, necessity is the mother of invention. And yes. here we are. So like tidying up the studio. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. But hey, what is also, <laughs> yeah, get on that for the last two weeks. And yeah. so... <laughs> We didn't plan this yesterday, all y'all know that. Yeah. Um, so, like, yeah, the, the studio just woke up this way. Uh, <laughs> exactly. No. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I think people should understand, which is really beautiful, is for many mosaic artists, like you say in the description of the course, is that we have to cover, you know, our substrates from beginning to end if it is going to be used for utilitarian purposes. But when we get into mm -hmm. fine art, we can do like what you're talking about. But that kind of leads into the other part that you are so talented at, and that's making a substrate that is going to be exposed look beautiful and I think if you want to show us now or how you want to do it but you do have some pretty amazing works around your studio that would give people an idea of what that is including the one right behind you that is yep. not in black uh, which is your normal but to see the blue that is exposed and how you did that so if you want to share some of that yeah, yeah. um yeah, so that, um, 
Okay. So do you want me to start walking around? Yeah, go for it. I think it's okay. going to be the best way to talk about you and space and your work. And then we'll get more into the details of what I'm sure people are dying to see is your storage and your uh, uh, easels. And we will have some special links for everybody. If you are interested in Kelly's storage and her easels, we actually will have links after this is over to tell you where to purchase them. So that's an extra, yeah. extra bonus. But yeah, yeah, why don't you give us a little walk around at some of okay. uh, the pieces okay. that explain your space uh, work. Okay, there's a lot of them hanging here in the studio that incorporate space. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to switch cameras so that um, you get to see from my perspective. Um, and it just so happens that we are facing um, some inspirational works um, that I go to when I'm thinking about space. And of course, I'm sure you're going to recognize Luca Barberini uh, up there. Those hey, two lovely. Kelly. Yeah. Okay. You're good now. It's, it's just a little delayed. So start with Luca again now that everyone's okay. seeing now. Okay. So there's Luca Barberini, a couple of works. The, he's a, he's a master of um, using space in mosaic. And uh, he's been a great inspiration for me. Also, as we just go down a little bit, Marion Shapiro, and look how she does space in the substrate. Okay, so these substrates are torn and she's introducing space in that way. So very inspiring. She's been doing that for a long time. And so I love having this piece to refer to, um, you know, for things like that, because it's just really, really inspiring. Um, so as we go up a little bit, you can see uh, space. Oops, sorry, I'm, I'm learning this thing space as a framing device okay that's one way to use space is the mosaic is in the middle the space is around the edge okay so that is used there very effectively um and then as we scoot over you see space what i call space as a backdrop and then your mosaic is this beautiful jewel that exists on this backdrop of space. So the, the mosaic is like 50% or less of the whole uh, footprint of the mosaic. So it's like jewelry, you just drop it out there on that gorgeous backdrop. Um, this little guy shows a couple of things. Let me see if I can zoom. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning this as we go. So um, I don't think I can zoom with any degree of accuracy, but there you go. So down at the bottom, you see space as a gradient. You see the pieces start to trickle out a little bit at the bottom. And then I'm not sure you can see, but there's a line through the center, just below those chunky pieces of crockery that is just a line of space. And so it's a big drop off from those chunky uh, pieces of crockery, which is another way to use space is as a real visual and textural um, change. Okay, so drop off. So tall things seem really even taller. And there you can really see the space gradient in that one up there. So those tesserae are just petering out into nothing. And that's another thing we talk about in the, we talk about all these methods in the, uh, in the workshop. So you'll get them all. And then this guy, whoo baby, that's a lot of space. Um, and it's space interior to the tesserae. Okay, so let's see if I can show you this whole thing. It's three by five, um, but it's space that's interior to the tesserae. So not so much around them as inside them. Okay, so that's another way. So when we talk about this in the workshop, is to capture space inside tesserae, okay? And then we're gonna scoot over a little bit. Uh, and you can see up there that tall skinny guy. Uh, there's a whole bunch of really active tall stuff in the middle, space as a framing device. The little guy here, space as a framing device around the edge. I don't know if you can tell that that space is colored it was black, and then I put some uh, some paint washes over it, a little sealer wash over it. Okay, this one, tiny bit of space at the edge as a framing device, but not much. Um, and this little doodah, 
a lot of space around the edge. Okay, so the design is very central. It's very much in one place. And then the space goes out from that. So a little bit of gradient. And then you also, you'll notice with that one that it's wrapped with epoxy sculpt in a couple of different colors. <laughs> a little preview for another workshop coming up. Um, and then this one, a little space at the top, just so that that stone drops off a little bit. So there's so many ways to do this. Space all the way around the thing, again with the backdrop. Okay, and then again, framing device. And then we get big again, we get really big. Um, <laughs> up here, this piece up here is four feet by four feet and lots of space both around the edge as a framing device and captured within the tesserae. Okay, so, so many, many ways to use space in mosaic. It never gets old. <laughs> There's always new things to discover. And so, we, yeah, we'll show you this one where the space occurs. This is a very, very dense piece, okay? Obviously very dense. Oops, oh, sorry, I get my directions mixed up here. Oh, I'm gonna get the hang of this. But it's right where the, if you want to think of it this way, right where the sort of the sky meets the earth, there's that midnight blue mortar that's just showing all along that sort of horizon line. Um, yeah. So that just, that's sort of a, an overview of all the different ways. Um, let me get back to going this way. Um, so there's the other end of the studio. Mm -hmm. Not a ton of mosaics over yeah. here, but oh yeah, okay. So, that's another one with crockery, that space as a framing device. What I love about space as a framing device is that you don't have to have a custom sized um, substrate. Okay, so your black serves as the customizable surface. It doesn't have to be black. I'm just saying black because that's what's in front of me. But um, I don't have to custom cut my substrate. I can custom, I can let my mosaic do what it does and just um, end up wherever it ends up and still be fully supported and yet still be a very specific shape. The mosaic itself is a different shape than the substrate. Um, so that's another factor of space in the um, uh, space as a framing device. And there it is pretty straightforward with that little guy, space as a framing device, blah, blah, blah. And here in this one, it's older work with glass. This is space as a drop off uh, within the ceramic and glass. Um, there's a big hole there that just is, is one layer of glass inside the porcelain. So that's another sort of exploration of space. That, that's a good one for people that are familiar with your work that started with that course with radical dimensions in yeah, that's stained glass radical mosaic. Radical dimensions in glass right there. And now yep. they can learn this technique and sort of have a nice merging of the two techniques. So oh, it's great to see yeah. how your work has really got some amazing foundations and building blocks to work off of each other. Absolutely. And all of these things can be combined. And I would hope you would combine, you know, that's how we make styles into our own is we, how we combine them and how we, uh, transform them by adding them to other things uh, to, to create our own unique voice. Um, so this little guy is called Flit and um, it has both space around the edges, so space as a framing device, and then inside those ring tesserae is just space. So it has, it combines both of those things. And so that was another thing that it felt crucial to um, to show in the, in the workshop was that um, you can combine these. It's not just, um, coming back to me, um, you can combine these different ways to use space. You don't have to um, just say, okay, I'm going to explore this. No, you can put them together. And in fact, it's more interesting when you do. Okay, so it's much more, um, it's much more um, complex and original and unique and fun when you can combine a couple of ways of using space.
So. Well, and we did take your Kick Ossiette piece from Mosaic Arts Online and yes. used it as part of the intro for space yes. because it yes. was combining yes. those two so perfectly. For those that All have taken that course, then you yep. sort of got a touch of what Kelly goes much deeper into in this course. And Kelly shares about eight different ways that you can incorporate space into your mosaic art. And so you're all seeing it, you know, one way, but I think there's some hidden gems in each of Kelly's pieces that you've just seen that maybe you didn't think about that Kelly does use space. We do have one question from someone that I was yep. waiting for it to come as soon as yep. you showed the piece, but Jacqueline yep. asked, what is that tessera that are those round circles up there? They're paper. They're paper. Yeah. They, so and in, one thing I wanted to, to say too is in the, um, one of the things that we cover in the workshop is how to make the space look good, right? Because it's exposed, right? So you want to make sure that it's pretty, like, because it's part of the artwork, right? It's, it's what people are going to see um, in addition to your mosaic. So it needs to look nice. So uh, that's another thing we talk about um, in the workshop is how to make that space look pretty. Yeah, and you share a couple different ways to do that, depending yep. on what color you know you're using and stuff yep. like that. But it's really, really important that if you are going to create a piece like this, Kelly created this piece, but then it was looking a little rough on the edges. And once she did the finishing touches on it, which she shows in the course, then it really pops and it really makes it look fine art and cleaned up and beautiful. And yes, I totally agree that Kelly is one of the masters of using her spatula and <laughs> mortar and whatever tint color you like, you know, Mosaic Arts Online yeah. does sell them. You can have at your, you know, disposal. Do you want to dive in just lightly on like some of the different things that are space that you like to, to work with, like the line and things like that? Oh, yeah. Space as a line. Let's see. I don't think there's, I'm just looking around to see. I don't think I have a piece that illustrates that, but the use of space, um, the your interstices, how to line up your interstices. I mean, we all see, we all know how it goes, um, you know, when you have lines of mosaic, right? And so lines of ondamento and, you know, in between those lines is, um, is a line of mortar or whatever. And that's your, you know, you get that information, but it's also possible to, um, to use uh, an, an interstice to, to almost draw with it through your mosaic and create lines that pass through your mosaic in different ways, um, very clear ways in a composition um, that, uh, that point up that line uh, distinct from any other aspect of the composition. So that's another thing we talk about in the workshop is space as a line. And also just by, um, oh, here it is. This, this is, okay, wait a minute. Let me, let me switch my camera back because oh, I'm getting so good at this um, <laughs> ish. Uh, so if we go back up here, um, you can see that each line, each horizontal line of that mosaic has um, a horizontal line passing through it. And that's my sort of, that's what I'm talking about is lining your interstices. So these four quartered or two, two halved tesserae uh, pieces that are, that comprise this mosaic. I've lined up their, um, I've lined up their connectors so that they, you know, sort of stripe across uh, horizontally. Uh, at every cross point there. So I guess that is one example of that. But it's a really fun technique because it's kind of like drawing. It's a little bit like drawing and it, it does require a little bit of, um, I'm switching back to me. Um, it does require a little bit of pre-planning because um, of how you cut and where you want to do that. Because when you wanna do that, you have to make sure that other things in the mosaic don't line up. That's how you contrast and make that one line really stand out. So. Well, and I think that's what's so amazing about your work is that you take these materials, which if anyone can picture what those look like sitting on our table, just waiting to be used was nothing in any kind of order. And the beauty and order that you pulled together to make the eye go, oh God, I gotta have that mm -hmm. from what was there is is just the talent. And, and I wanna say Kelly's talent, I know from knowing Kelly as long as I have, comes from showing up in her studio 
every single day <laughs> to very late in the evening most days. But that's yeah. what Kelly does. And that is why you're seeing such beautiful evolution in her work from radical dimensions to these pieces. And it's really incredible. On that note, would you turn around and show us some of the stuff on your easels? Is that okay? Ooh, yes. Um, oh, let me just change that. my camera around. All right, again. change that camera and show us what's happening in the in the works. I will. Um, okay. So let's just um, let me just get my goobers together here. Um, there's the doors of my studio. La la la. Um, just while we're on our way over to the easel. Um, yeah, I love working with an easel, working on an easel because. Um, <laughs> my back, you know, I, I don't want to lose my functionality in my back, um, from hunching over and I don't like pain. So, um, I have this lovely, um, hardwood easel that I have up on my table, unless the work is really tall. And then I put it on my floor when I need to work at the look, when I need to work on the top of the work of the, of the piece. Um, so this is an easel. Uh, we're going to have the information in, um, in the, uh, you know, the recording in the comments, the comments section. Once it's over, it'll be underneath yeah. the video available with links. Yeah. So um, it's really lovely to work on the easel because um it's again, like I said, pain free. And um, when you work with mortar, uh, you can do this. You can work on an easel and nothing slides. Okay, so I can um, I can stick stuff up uh, on that with mortar on the on the board and nothing slips. Uh, it really teaches you working with an easel <laughs> teaches you really quickly what your uh, correct consistency of mortar should be. Um, so that it does not slide. And so it's really, um, it's really helpful that way when you're working with mortar. With most other adhesives though, you can't work on an easel because, um, because it will slide. So this uh, easel, the reason why I love this particular easel is because it is adjustable six ways to Sunday. Um, so it has these crank, you can see those knobs that stick out and so everything goes up and down and out and, you know, back. And so I can adjust the angle, the height where I can always be working at eye level, which I love because I can just make um, this guy just go up and down, right? So I can just push the work up or pull it down so that I'm always working at eye level. So it has saved my back. I mean, because I do this full time, it felt crucial to... Um, you know, to have a way to do this safely. Over here, um, the piece that, oh, isn't that nice of the sun to just be shining so beautifully from the other direction on this piece of artwork? <laughs> Gotta love it. Thank you, universe. Um, but this easel, you've all seen these before. You might even have one um, for, for table working. It's just a small thing. It's very portable, has a couple of different angles. It's available at any art store, really, um, or some iteration of, and it's just super handy for, I've got it up on several bins because I'm a stander. I like to stand when I work. So um, I have it jacked up so that I don't have to bend over much at all. And this one is handy if I'm doing things that are, are tiny and picky and I don't need as sharp of an angle. You know, I don't need it to stand quite so straight up. Um, then this is the perfect easel for that. Also for smaller works, it's good for smaller stuff like this, like this small piece. So that's the easel thing. I just love them. I love them. Can't live without them. My back, you know, back and neck, they just, they don't ever hurt. And I feel like I'm doing an infomercial for easels, but, um, but yeah, I love them. I love working on an easel. You are um, you are referring to all of your courses as workshops, and just so everyone that's on this is clear, Kelly's referring to our courses as workshops, which is very interchangeable in our instructor lingo. So, in case when Kelly says it's this workshop, she's referring to her online courses at Mosaic Arts Online. And yes. when life gets back to normal, Kelly is a full-time artist as well as a very traveling instructor that does teach workshops 
workshops, which we kind of refer to as the live version of our online courses. Yeah. And while I have you here, Kelly, someone is asking, what is the board that you're framing your mosaics on? So maybe touch on substrates a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of weedy. Um, weedy board because it comes in many thicknesses. Um, right here, I'm working with, um, let's see if you can see, it's very, very, very thin, right? It's very thin. It's only an eighth of an inch thick, this weedy. And I, I jokingly call it weedy wafer um, <laughs> because it's so thin. I just love it. So uh, I work on that a lot. Um, I think these two are also the super thin guys. Yeah, they're both eighth inch. Um, down here, I've got a half inch. Um, but yeah, I'm very fond of weedy. Um, I have made my own substrates from um, mesh and mortar, but uh, I don't so much do that anymore because of the eighth inch weedy is so, um, it's so cuttable and it's so uh, easy, easily manipulatable that I don't really need to make my own substrates anymore um, because of that weedy wafer. So um, I'm, I hope I'm not making you seasick here. I'm just wandering around as I'm talking. No, the um, gimbal is great. The gimbal's doing great. And then you always put in your hanging hardware after you create, correct? Often, I often, often. do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like um, several, like this one that's on the easel over there does not have any hanging hardware on it yet. Um, yeah, a lot of these little guys um, down here don't have uh, hanging hardware on them yet because I don't always know um, what, uh, what orientation my work right. is. There's my, fr I'm, I'm inadvertently showing off my freshly swept floor because you'll never see it again. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Oh my God. It gets so crunchy in here. Um, so, uh, what are we talking about? Hanging hardware. Yeah. yeah. So I, I very often will not put the hanging hardware on until the end. And Tammy has like super helpfully put on a tutorial on mosaic arts online. That's free. That talks about how to put your hanging hardware on after. <laughs> so that's it's right. Super handy. But uh, the other thing I'll do, especially for really large works, where yeah. I have to put hanging hardware on is um, I will put it on several ways. Like I'll put on four-way hardware. So the client has a choice to um, hang the thing any way they want to. So, yeah. yeah. And so someone asked also, which you sort of answered, but maybe head back over to your piece with the big chunky brown rocks about how you did get those to stay in place without, you know, falling off and how much mortar did you really have to use? So, you know, they're secure for the life of the mosaic. Oh, well, um, thickness of mortar depends directly on the thickness of your tesserae right so the thicker the tesserae the thicker the mortar um, but this is not a thick uh, mortar bed that we're talking about here let's see if I can get up there super close it's not a thick mortar bed okay see that it's not like standing up so for comparison let's do this let's show you that so they're pretty flat to the board okay now let's come over here and I'll show you Todd's Mortar bed, this is my studio mate's area. And he's working with Smalty and he has a much thicker mortar bed. I don't know if you can, can you see that? Much thicker. He puts his down on a really thick mortar bed. Me, not so much. And then how, um, thick, how thick is it for the piece that's hanging on the wall with the brown, big chunky brown rocks with the blue? Oh, those brown, the rest. Yeah. Oh, okay, hang Sorry. on, let's go there. Okay, I thought you meant the other one. Okay, okay, sorry, I'm getting the hang here. Woo, <laughs> that guy, right? That yes, yes, about? Melody, okay. Melody asked this question. She wanted to know how to get those up there. Okay, so, and I did work on that on my easel vertically, on my big easel, that the whole time I worked on that vertically, okay? I never worked on it flat. 
it was all vertical. And some of those things are really big and really heavy. So two things that I do is yes, really thick mortar bed. And because I want to make sure that the mortar comes at least uh, a third to a halfway up the tesserae. Okay. And just to be clear, another given in all of this work is that it's ungrouted. Okay. So we're, I'm never going to be grouting. So I don't have to worry about, you know, running, you know, having, having um, interstices that need filling. Okay. So I can fill those interstices up with the mortar bed that's coming up in between the tesserae. And that's what happens. In this case, it was a midnight blue mortar and it's coming up between the tesserae. So thick mortar bed. And my other trick uh, is that I use uh, an admix, a mortar admix. Okay, so I use MAPE mortar, usually at a Silex uh, P10, and I use the MAPE Caraply additive, which I'll show you, comes in. You can get this at Lowe's. Oops, wrong way. Come on, come with me, baby. Come on, come on down. Come on. It, the thing can't read my mind. That's the problem. It relies on my finger. See those jugs down there? That's the care apply. Okay, so it comes, you can get it at Lowe's. It comes in, um, it comes in those jugs. And pretty much if I'm using any MAPE mortar, I use that additive. I use that admix. Sometimes I cut it 50-50 with water, but in a, um, in a piece like this with the rust, you bet I used it 100% um, uh, strength. And it yeah. adds, it's basically the same polymer that's already in the mortar, but just more so, okay? And I learned about this both when I was in Italy working and also in Australia working about the strength and the stickiness that the admix lends to the work. So, um, so it's just super, super sticky. And so you're able to work. I was able to work on this vertically with even those heavy, those heavy pieces. It was all constructed vertically. And, and we'll put those both those products in the comment section as well, because I'm sure people will be wanting to know exactly which ones those are. But yes. as a mosaic artist as well, I couldn't agree with Kelly more how important it is if you are going to start working in this type of um, heavier materials that the admix will be your best friend and you yeah, won't probably ever go stuff. back. Um, and then one other question was, oh, wait, I'm a producer. Oh, one, one person is asking as you're on this piece, Kelly, which is perfect. Yeah. Someone is asking, and I don't know how much you want to give away right now is what is the colors that are wrapping around your mosaic? Oh yeah. And, and also while we're talking about this piece, let me just mention that bottom contour that dip, that's space in mosaic, okay? Yes. So this is one of the things we talk about in the video. We talk about a strategic interruption, okay? So which by which I mean that generally speaking, this is a rectangle. Woo, hello, wait, hold on, hold on, baby. Whoa, I'm getting sick, woo. Okay, generally speaking, that is a rectangle, right? But down at the bottom, I have interrupted that contour, that rectangularness with space. And that set the, t the entire concept of the design because that bump at the bottom is what creates the movement through the whole mosaic. So space can be, you know, crucial to, pivotal to the, the design or the concept, okay? So space is not just, inside the mosaic um, or a framing device or whatever, it's actually how do you interrupt your flow or the space that you assume is um, dominant and make it something different. Um, so anyway, the stuff uh, around the mosaic is epoxy sculpt. I'm a huge fan of epoxy sculpt. I rarely ever use it as an adhesive, <laughs> ironically, <laughs> hardly ever. Um, but I do use it as a framer and a delineator. Uh, and that's what, that's what all the color is in this mosaic, except for that gorgeous glass by Lisa Bonin, 
look at that strata glass. Man, that stuff is killer. Um, but yeah, epoxy sculpt, and you'll see more. Um, you'll see more of it in my epoxy sculpt workshop that will be out um, sooner or later. Um, <laughs> and so, like, here's a here's some edging on a piece that is epoxy sculpt again. So it's lovely. It's lovely for edging and uh, very clean edge, um, very clean, very tidy, almost invisible, but tough and very easy to do. Um, so yeah, we'll get into that in another uh, video. Yes. Yeah, so please be patient with us. We are working around the clock here. You have no idea. Jerry's editing left and right these days, but Kelly does have um, a few more courses, literally not two, but a few more courses coming down the pipe and yeah. we will have epoxy sculpt out hopefully before the holidays. So if you need a gift, there it is. And then, um, the question that hello Lenny Gilbert had is um, how do you make your edges of your mosaic uneven while they're sitting on the easel, like at the bottom? Like, how did you do that piece that right there? Like while it was on the easel, how were you able to manipulate your uneven edges when it's sitting on that straight edge of the bottom? Hopefully I'm asking the question correctly. Yes, I understand what you mean. And it's actually a really, really good question from a construction point of view, because um, one thing I'll do is I'll turn the mosaic the other way, right? So that 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 um, uh, that edge is the, is not uh, on the bottom. You know, I'll turn it sideways and work on it that way. Okay, or I will lay it flat, do the edge, wait until it hardens, put it back up. You know, but these uneven guys, um, these guys that stick out. So all I'm doing there is I am letting the mosaic line end where it ends with tesserae sticking out. And then I strengthen that because the, the underlying shape is just a rectangle, okay? Just a rectangle, weedy board. And so I will go back when the mosaic is done, I will go back around those pieces and behind them and I will... Um, I will shore them up with mosaic, I mean, with uh, mortar behind them, okay? So I will build them up with mortar behind and then uh, wrap them with the epoxy and then they are, they are very much strengthened. And same with, same with up here, these edges, okay? Thing, I just let things stick out. Um, in this case, uh, up there, where you see, okay, let's see, see that top contour? It's harder to see when I'm closer. Let me see if I can back up without tripping over my chair with this gimbal. <laughs> if you hear a big crash and a thud, uh, that's because I've, I've hit the floor. Um, so that top contour is, um, you know, it's very, very customized, right? And so what I did was I, I built the mosaic on a two foot by three foot rectangle of weedy. And then at the end, I just cut away the excess weedy from those areas. So I just contoured the thing at the end, just cut away the weedy, like didn't go all the way out to the edge of the weedy and then just cut around the tesserae with the utility knife, my best friend. <laughs> you know, so maybe so people understand, uh, I, you know, work in weedy board as well. And when you buy that eighth inch weedy board, it is kind of wobbly, but yep, yep, you, yep. by adding the mortar, it becomes this hard strengthened piece. Yes. And maybe you can elaborate a little more on that so that people yes. understand, even though it's thin, when it starts, it is a fine piece of art that can hang on a wall, no problem. Yes, and it also assumes that strengthening assumes you're using mortar as your adhesive, okay? Because mortar is Absolutely. the strengthener. Yeah, no, no, so, no, no, no. Yeah. So this is another example. This piece right here is another example of one that I am going to trim the weedy away when I'm done with the mosaic, okay? So you see these, these outer contour line, these registration marks out here? That's the end of the mosaic, okay? Um, so up at the top, it's pretty much all done up at the top and over here on the, the left edge. So when I'm completely done with the mosaic, I'm just going to trim away that excess weedy that you see and just leave the mosaic. 
So it'll be a very customized edge, uh, but I didn't have to custom cut that in advance and I could allow the mosaic to do what it does and make some lines longer, shorter, blah, 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 on the fly um, uh, freely. And they're completely supported underneath. So this is a little bit different from what I just explained on the rectangular striped piece to the left about letting those pieces hang over and then trimming or, and then, you know, backing them up. This, I just, I decided to keep the weedy underneath it and just allow the lines to expand or contract as felt good in the moment. And then I'll just, they're completely supported and I'll just trim that weedy away oh, and yeah. then wrap the edges. Kelly, people are asking what that sticks looking material is for those that don't follow you. Maybe <laughs> okay, you well, here it is. Um, you tell me, what does that look like? <laughs> As organic as it gets. And they look kind of right. gold on top, though. <laughs> uh, that is the inside, okay? That is uh, the twigs. That's that's the inside of the twigs. So let me just show you here. I have one um, that I can show you. Twig, no rubbing buff? Outside of the twig, inside of the twig. It's nice. just, the natural, just the natural interior of the twig. Um, yeah, twigs from the maple tree out that's shedding all over my front walk. <laughs> so I have an en an endless supply of, if, of twigs. If this isn't upcycle, recycle, I'm not sure what is. I'm telling you, a uh, never-ending supply. You, speaking of supply. Yes, uh, I was just going to say, please dive into how <laughs> all of your materials are organized. Okay, so as you can see... Like uh, you may have noticed when I backed up, I'll do it again. I'll back up to my door and show you the full on. Um, here's the whole studio. I'll even step backwards out the door. Um, there's the full studio. It's about 18 feet deep, 10 feet wide. Okay. And so we have storage going up the wall and then we have storage um, underneath the tables okay of course they see that's where it gets ugly i didn't want to show you that but here you know um we're all this way so there you go <laughs> underneath the tables so we made an agreement my studio mate and i made an agreement that our storage would only go um x amount up the wall so that we'd have room to hang art um so we have a limitation on how much storage we can have in here so we chose storage that is uh, transparent because if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. I don't know about you, but that's kind of my, uh, <laughs> that's kind of how my brain works. If I can't see it, I forget that I have it. So um, we have these, these are six inch by six inch cubes and we've got the product information for you. You can get them all kinds of places on the web. Um, I'll give you the, I'll give you the part numbers so you can search them. Um, and there's two drawer ones and there's four drawer ones. And of course they're all interchangeable. And then over here, oops, here we go. We're getting over here uh, to the stone area. We have open ones. They're just open six inch cubes uh, that we just slot our stone into um, and our smalty pizza stuff. Um, and so our philosophy here in um, storage is if I can get it easily, I don't store it, generally speaking. I don't store it in my studio. I make sure that this storage is for super cool stuff. Okay, so super cool stuff that's inspiring and, um, you know, whatever. This is my color section. I don't, I don't really get involved in the color section too often. I spend more time over here in the, isn't this just awesomely cool, neutral, oops, business, sorry. I hope I'm not making you sick. I'm trying to get the hang. So, so that's kind of my philosophy that, that if I can get it easily, I don't store a bunch of it in my studio because we have such limited storage here. So that's kind of my rule of thumb and it helps me to be, um, it helps me to edit my, um, my stuff. Um, otherwise, you know how it is. 
um, I would be drowning in materials. And so, you know, I got that really cool Marmo uh, Millefiori. Oh, I love that stuff. So there's all kinds of just really cool stuff. And then um, uh, underneath uh, down here, larger format stuff. I use these clip bins, you know, these clip boxes from Sterilite. Um, they're awesome. They're easy to get and they have a couple of different sizes. Um, so just the clip boxes and then erasable labels that I use with Sharpie and uh, so that I can change the contents if I run out of something or change my mind and want to store something else. Um, so, you know, like there's a bin or a box of rusty stuff. There's a, you know, different things that I want that are too big to put in these tiny little drawers up top. Um, so that's kind of how the storage thing goes. And then, oh, I wanted to show you how we do our hammers and hardies. Um, so we've got our standing hardy there as you can see. And then the hammers are just all along the table. We've got those um, pipe clamps um, and there's just our, our selection of hammers. Um, so that's how that works. And then we've got some, um, whoops, I'm totally gonna get the hang of this one of these days. We've got those tabletop hardies. Okay, we've got a selection of those um, handy handy. Uh, so let's see. Um, and then here's our mortar station, uh, <laughs> a couple different kinds of mortar. And I've got my custom colors back here that I've done in the Talenti containers. Aren't those the best for everything? Again, with the erasable labels. Um, so I can make up small batches, test batches. I don't use a ton of colored mortar, but I like to have these custom colors uh, ready um, and I like to play with different color combinations. And then we have our, um, we have our ever so valuable chisel. Um, on. Okay. Hello everyone. Sorry about that little, um, blip, but Kelly is back now with our studio tour and keep on going, Kelly. Okay, so we were just talking about the chisel area because we're not super great at cleaning our tools uh, right after the session. So we often have to chisel them off the next day. This is so much oversharing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just hoping that um, it's, you know, you're, you're relating and you're understanding and you're, um, you're with me on this because you do it too. Just tell me you do, that's all good. Um, so is there anything else? What is there anything else specifically you'd like me to, to talk about? There was one other question. Someone just wanted a little more clarification. Is that real rust in that piece up there? Ooh, that yes. you, and if so, they had heard, but maybe it's not true, that the mappe and the caraply won't hold real rust pieces. Well, here's the thing about rust is that when you put a rusty piece down into mortar, basically you are attaching rust to mortar. So that may be what they're talking about. And yeah, that is risky. Um, so it's always a good idea uh, to, um, you know, like the part of your rusty piece that's going down into mortar to brush that really well first, to brush off all that, um, you know, the, the active rust, to brush it off and, you know, belt and suspenders, put a coat of epoxy over it, you know, brush on epoxy over that and then attach it to your mortar, you know, because yeah, you, you do want to be conscious of the vulnerabilities of what you're working with and, um, you know, treat it accordingly. Uh, if you want to have absolutely solid, you know, this will never fall apart. You know, it'll be, they'll be digging it up in, you know, 2746 and saying, oh my God, this is what they did back then. Look how it's <laughs> held together. <laughs> this is how Kelly Knickerbocker did it back then. Uh, you know, one other so question, question, do you seal your twigs in your piece just below that one? Ah, do you seal your twigs? Are you sealing your twigs then? Um, uh, yes, I will. I will seal the exposed ends of those twigs. Yes, 
I will use a wood sealer on those exposed edges, on those exposed ends. Uh, but I don't seal the body of the twig that I put down in the mortar. Um, and even though I am sealing the ends, anytime you use organic material, you know, for example, over here with the whole paper thing up there, eventually that paper is going to die, right? It's organic. It, paper does not last for centuries. It does not. So that is a transient material and it will die. It will someday just rot away. And, um, you know, this piece is uh, seven years old, uh, seven or eight years old, and it's doing great. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's not going to last like Roman mosaics. But it's one of those things like space. Organic material um, is sort of a, a, a push or a, an expansion of what we think of as. Um, you know, what is mosaic, right? So, so historically, mosaic has always been hard materials like stone, glass, and period, stop, you know, and cover the whole dang thing. So we are pushing those notions and saying, oh, really? Does it have to be? Let's just push those boundaries a little bit and see um, what are the artistic uh, merits to, to challenging that? And I don't mean challenging in like a, hey, I'm going to do it my own way. I, ah, fuck you. I'm, oops, sorry. I just did that thing. Um, it's an official Kelly Knickerbocker <laughs> <sorry>. event. <laughs> um, so I don't mean challenge in a, um, you know, an, an, an annoyed way or in a, an angry way, but just an expansion of what mosaic can be. You know, does it have to be that? Can it be more than what it has always been? And so it's great to ask those questions and also to be able to, to say more things conceptually by putting um, these different materials together because we're saying um, conceptually, I love to talk about tran uh, transient and durable. You know, that's life, right? That's, that's all the time what we're dealing with what stays, what goes, what's vulnerable, what's durable. So, you know, I think to speak eloquently, we have to think outside the, you know, it can only be this way. And, uh, and when you, you know. sell your pieces that do have that sort of not forever lifetime on the materials, how do you present it to your client? Um. <laughs> I've never had anybody require a presentation on that because it's pretty <laughs> obvious what it is, you know? So yes, the paper towels, I have visited the studio seven years ago and the paper, <laughs> paper towels still look exactly as they exactly did. The so it's, yeah. it's good to know that, you know, yeah. to making experiments like that is, it is still an experiment in a way, yeah. but it, it is definitely holding up in a good way. Someone is asking, how do you color your epoxy? And I'm going to answer that by stay tuned. It's coming <laughs> very, very soon to a Yeah, court. you'll get all the details. And you'll, you'll get, get all of my, I'll spill all the beans all over everything um, yes. about the epoxy sculpt and I won't do very much talking about epoxy sculpt as an adhesive no because <laughs> it's not my jam um you've got there's other videos for that so I'll just touch on that briefly but I will talk about molding things out of it and using it as a delineator and a and a divider or, you I mean, do a wrap it does adhere itself to the edges of yep. your mosaic, but that exactly. is not yeah. necessarily yep. an adhesive to a tessera yeah. as other artists we know like to yeah. use it. Exactly. We will add it to your list, but someone is asking what you use for those um, wipe off tags on your uh, snap bins. So um, you can get me that information as yeah, well. Yeah, it's just Sharpie on, um, I just looked up, uh, erasable labels on Amazon there you go. <clears throat> and you know, I use Sharpie and it, it comes off and I can change it, but it doesn't come off so easily that, you know, like wet erase or whatever, or dry right. erase. It's not like that. It's, it's more permanent than that, but it can be erased. 
That's great. And then China markers, those come from Amazon. We get a lot of our studio materials from Amazon. And like I said, as soon as this uh, presentation is over, we will be able to add to the comments where her storage bins come from, where the easels come from. Yeah. And um, if you do have any other questions or comments after the event, please feel free to either email Tammy at mosaicartsonline.com or put it on the comments of the YouTube. But yeah. wait, my producer's putting his hand up for one more question. <laughs> to work as a black background is it black colored mortar inside? yes the black in kelly's work is it black colored mortar and is mortar and thin set the same thing yes yeah thin set is just a um like there's thin set medium bed and thick bed mortars so it's all the same thing it's just different different types of mortar that are so thin set is meant to be uh no thicker than like a quarter of an inch or three eighths of an inch thick um, because it'll, it can crack. So, um, oh, we lost you, Kel. Uh oh, hold on. There you oh, are. There you go. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, mortar and thin set are the same thing in, in, in this language. Um, yeah. but yeah, so the, the black that you see in the backgrounds is definitely a uh, thin set. And I tint it with, um, carbon black, um, carbon black tint uh, from Sherry Warner Hunter. And again, I, I, there's another super awesome free tutorial on Mosaic Arts Online about making black mortar. And so you can go and look at that free tutorial and see all about how, um, how the mortar becomes black. Mm -hmm. But any color, you know, you can do that with any color. You can tint mortar any color. It, it comes in gray and white and you can uh, tint it any color with pigments that are meant for uh, cement products. Yes, and those you can get some of those tints as well through Mosaic Arts Online, yes. just because we have a lot of artists that are using them in their courses, so we yes. wanted to make them available to everybody. So yes. if we don't have any more questions, I'm just looking over at the producer with the finger going up, <laughs> There's always more questions. This is great. What do you use to draw the white color on the wedding board? Oh, someone, someone's asking what you use to draw the white lines on your weedy board, like behind you. Yeah, that's China marker or um, uh, grease pencil. Same thing. They're this China marker and grease pencil are the same thing. So I'm just I'm trying not to back into it, but there you go. <laughs> you can see there's the, yeah, lots of lines there. And that's the China marker or um, grease pencil. Um, super handy, super handy for that. Yeah. Wood. What do you mean? The so in the course, Kelly, like I said, goes over many concepts about creating this piece. So now that maybe you understand a little bit more about how she uses space and how she creates with the different tessera and makes it look clean and beautiful and really <laughs> controls where you want your eye to go. Then on that note, we have a little bonus for you. So I'm gonna go big so y'all can read this because not only are we giving you Kelly's brand new course, Mind the Gap, Space as a Mosaic Design Element, but look at that. All of Kelly's courses ooh, are ooh. now available at Mosaic Arts Online for 15% off. What? Ooh. Yeah, you're welcome. 15% <laughs> off till Monday at midnight, because we know we have some people that probably just fell asleep into Sunday. So we're giving them a couple <laughs> days. Thank you, Europe, for getting on. And so here is your code, Kelly15, for all of these courses, one or all of the above are yours. So take all that in right now. It will also be in the um, comment section of our YouTube video for replay. So all of you have gotten that information and I cannot thank you enough, Kelly. This was awesome. Your gimbal skills are off the chart. They are oh, amazing. I'm, I'm getting there. Thanks for your no, patience. You did, you did fantastic. And I can't thank cool. everybody enough for being here, enjoying a Saturday, whatever time it is by you yeah. or Sunday um, with us. It's been such a pleasure to um, talk to you and share your studio with us. 
If there are more questions coming in, like I said, don't be afraid to put them in the comment section of this live event because they will be answered by myself or Kelly yep. or both. And go ahead, jump on Mosaic Arts Online right now and enjoy 15% off for the next 48 hours of this gorgeous, amazing, talented artist and all the work that she shares here at Mosaic Arts Online, which we cannot be more grateful for. So. Thank you everyone and we'll see you again. <laughs> we'll have more lives coming up. We have some really amazing stuff coming from Mosaic Arts Online before the year ends. Please, please everyone stay safe, stay well, most importantly, stay sane. And we will see you here again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Great.